Welcome back to the Red Zone Podcast. This is episode 7. As usual, got a bunch of stuff I want to talk about, including the historic, historically good college football playoff semifinal games, LSU's bowl beatdown versus Purdue, Tulane in another classic on New Year's Eve versus USC, just some amazing, amazing games all over, plus previewing the national championship game, UGA TCU, and going to talk some Pelicans at the end. A lot of stuff, a lot of different developing storylines going on with the Pelicans. A lot of positives, a lot of negatives. A very interesting season, but still floating around the top three seeds, given everything that's happened, which, you know, as I've said before, is, is crazy impressive. But before I get into anything, I didn't want to go too long on this or make a whole segment out of it to avoid being like too cliche or just repeating what people have been saying in the same way that I didn't want to talk too much about Mike Leach beyond what my own personal experience lent itself to. And in the Sunday night football game between the Bengals and the Bills, DeMar Hamlin collapsed due to a cardiac arrest which seemingly is a very rare event that can be caused by sheer trauma impact trauma to your heart at a certain precise point in its uh cycle so very very unfortunate very unlucky very scary um had to get cpr on the field was being resuscitated on the field apparently though a lot of positive things have happened with him He's on 50% oxygen. They've said that they've seen a lot of uh, small progress signs that they've been looking for since it happened. But, you know, I it, it really is. It's just so scary. And the, the, the thing that has impressed me most, uh, which I'm not the first to mention, is his toy drive fund is... Over five million dollars raised now when the goal was twenty five hundred. So you know, just seeing what happens when all these people, you know, just come together and realize, you know, the guys that they're supporting uh deserve that support no matter what. And you know, just seeing like the two different teams fans and fans across all the NFL um do so much to to help this guy because obviously you can always just say hey this is really sad what happened to this guy you know i hope i hope he's okay but for so much money to be put down was just so so impressive to me in such a short amount of time and i just that that really touched me and it made me think a lot about you know, the power of, of sports and sports fans and what they can do. And it's a lot to think about. And as of now, I checked earlier, the signs have been positive. He's still on 50% oxygen, if I uh, have read the headlines correct. So some positives, still a long way to go, but certainly some some good signs for DeMar Hamlin, which is all we could could ask for at this point considering what a lot of us might have feared uh when it happened but moving on to the much much less important topics but the much more exciting ones as well the first college football semifinal game that i'm going to talk about was in my opinion the less exciting one which is crazy because it was an unbelievable game and probably a top three semifinal game ever. Um, what a game. And this one I was wrong about because I stuck to how I felt about a lot of these bowl games and the college football playoff semifinals from when I did my preview episode. 
And I still felt the same. When I did my preview episode, I said, I think Ohio State probably loses this by multiple scores. I think Stroud's an amazing player. I think Harrison's great. I think they've got talent. But I didn't think they had the game-breaking talent at the places that people didn't know about. Because everybody knew Stroud was great. Everybody knew Harrison was great. Everybody knows they have a great receiving group. And... um but I didn't think they had the defensive playmakers. I didn't think their O line would be able to hold up. So I thought, I thought those would be some problem spots, and I was wrong. Um, Ohio State deserved to win that game. They uh, they they really choked it away uh, with 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 how they finished up, considering how they played in that matchup. But you also can't take away a heroic comeback effort from Georgia to bring their season back from the brink. Um, you know, as you can see, UGA took this one 42-41. Ohio State did have a chance to win the game with a field goal at the last second. A 50-yarder uh, for Noah Ruggles, who had made a 48-yarder quite easily a few minutes prior. And... He just shanked it. It wasn't close. There's not really any point in talking about it. It was a horrible kick. It was never anywhere close. And UGA went through. And my biggest issues, really, were just with Ryan Day, who I feel like has consistently, consistently been unable to prove that he is capable of winning the big game like Urban Meyer was. I've talked about this before on the podcast. These guys, they just aren't the same coach. In the regular season, maybe they're similar. You know, I I think Ryan Day does a good job in general in the regular season. I don't think he does as well as Urban Meyer. I think the fact that they've lost two in a row to this Michigan team is not a good sign. But I think he does okay. But in the crucial moments, once again, he was outcoached. One of the most brutal moments, too, for this was Kirby Smart calling a timeout on a fourth and one just before a fake punt by Ohio State. He calls it as the play is starting. It's revealed. It's obvious. And it's like, you got to wonder who saw that. But that really felt like not only a turning point, but also like an illustration of how good that Georgia coaching staff really is. They they got it right out coming out of the second half. And I mean, they outgained Ohio State by over 70 yards, you know. They let Ohio State get theirs, but in the fourth quarter, they dominated. They put it on and they said, hey, we have got to win. This is it. We're the best team in the country. We got to put it together. And they did everything they could. I really thought Ohio State had it there for a sec. They didn't. Uh, now, there were a few players for Ohio State that I thought, regardless of the loss, were probably the best players on the field. Um, C.J. Stroud was really, really something. He, he will make throws so consistently that just make me just my jaw drop. He is my favorite quarterback prospect that I have watched in a very long time. I, I, Joe Burrow was better in college. I liked watching Joe Burrow more, but Joe Burrow was three years older than CJ Stroud is. Joe Burrow was 24. CJ Stroud is 21. He is the number one quarterback in the draft for me. I'm taking him over Bryce Young. You can bet your ass I'm taking him over Will Levis. You can't show me enough TikTok videos of him throwing in shorts to get me to take Will Levis over CJ Stroud. Watch them. Watch them play. CJ Stroud is the type quarterback who wants a drive, and maybe that's actually not even enough because he had a couple drives against Georgia where the every single throw... I was amazed. He has this incredible ability to make 
every throw or every catch so easy on his receivers. He makes the unbelievable throws. He puts the ball in a perfect position when nobody thinks he can or thinks he could. But on the easy throws, on the crossing routes, on the outs, he's putting the outs right in the receiver's hands where the cornerbacks can't get them. On the ins, he's putting it in their chest, leading them so they can keep running. He does it so casually, every single throw exactly where it needs to be, pinpoint, just a dissection. Some of the throws that he made versus Georgia had to be that perfect. There were a few throws early in that game on late downs where if he doesn't make them, Georgia turns the ball over, gets it back, and has a chance to build a lead or, or, or get more scores on the board and get to a lead in the first place. You know, Ohio State doesn't get out to that huge lead without Marvin Harrison Jr. and C.J. Stroud dominating early. Now, they schemed Marvin Harrison out of the game, and then he got injured late, and that undeniably hurt Ohio State. Even with him schemed out a bit, there's no doubt you want him in that stretch run, for sure. But you had you had um, Emeka Ibuka, who had eight receptions, 112 yards, and a touchdown, who really, really stood out past the first quarter. So Ohio State had the weapons. Their running game wasn't great, you know, but it later in the game, it got the job done. They seem to have worn down Georgia a bit later. Now, Georgia did what they had to do. And I don't think anybody would say this was Georgia's best performance all year because there's a certain level of expectation for Georgia. But... They did what they had to do. Now, Stetson Bennett did not play as well as his stat line indicates. Stetson Bennett's stat line is very similar to C.J. Stroud's. That's why you have to watch football games. For example, the 75-yard touchdown to Arian Smith was just wide open. That's one one completion, 75 yards, touchdown. C.J. Stroud didn't have a throw that easy all night. But he played well enough down the stretch. And that sort of was the theme for Georgia. And I think that's kind of almost given me a level of, of appreciation for them in a way that I wouldn't have had if they had won by two scores like I expected. They have this grit that even when teams show them something they're not used to, when they get pushed further than they expect, and it happens because they're not a perfect team, even when this stuff happens, they are ready. And they punch back, and they get up, and they get up every time. And that's that's part of what makes them so scary, and what reminds me of previous Bama teams, is no matter what you do, you just can't knock them out. They're just too good. Now, Georgia on offense was able to pass the ball a ton, 400 yards. Their receivers constantly were getting open. OSU's DBs had a really difficult time keeping the the UGA wide receivers in front of them. Now, they also ran the ball okay. Now, maybe not as well as I'd expected. I kind of thought they would just steamroll them. They had five yards per carry, which is good. You're going to take that. But aside from Kenny McIntosh, who had an unbelievable game, you know, they only had 100 and, uh, 135 yards on the ground, and 70 of those were for McIntosh. They, aside from the third quarter, they were able to move the ball pretty much at will. So it was always going to be about OSU scoring enough points to to hold them off. And they had a chance to get that final field goal to win it, but but they didn't. And I don't think you can rely on a 50-yard field goal from from Noah Ruggles to win that game. I think is I think is Ryan Day you have to attack a bit more reasonably on that final set of downs and realize how much time you have 
and maybe not restrict yourself to just short outs all day. But, you know, in the end, they played better than I expected. It's just that when you put yourself in that position, you should probably win. And I think Ohio State's going to be kicking themselves about that for, for quite a long time. Now, this game, I can't even... This, thinking about this game puts a smile on my face. This was my favorite college football playoff game ever, aside from LSU's championship game win over, over Clemson. And obviously, there's bias there. That game was not as entertaining, not even close to this one. This game was special. <laughs> From the very beginning, you could tell this game was going to be a bit chaotic. First score of the game is a 40-yard Bud Clark pick six on J.J. McCarthy. Oh, this game was just back and forth. But the weirdest thing about this feeling like such a back and forth great game, TCU led all 60 minutes. Actually, that's incorrect. They led for 54 and a half minutes. Um, but what a game. What a game. It, it's, I, I, it's hard for me to even speak analytically about it because I, I, I just, this reminded me of why I loved college football. I said this game would be close. I said TCU could win it. I thought it would be a lot lower scoring if they did. Now, TCU was the underdog just like Ohio State was. And I think a lot of people thought that Michigan's defense was going to be a bit too good. Michigan was going to be a bit too physical and athletic for TCU, which I didn't buy. And they didn't either. And they showed up minute one, ready to, ready to really put it on Michigan. And them getting that early lead was huge, right? I, I think they needed that. And, and it's impossible to know otherwise, but they get out to that 14-0 lead early thanks to the Bud Clark pick six. Max Duggan caps off a 76-yard drive to make it 14-0. Moody goes down, they get a field goal, but then TCU just comes right back and scores a touchdown. And at this point, you're just like, wow, Michigan's just going to get blown out again. It, it really felt like that for a second. And I was ready to say that Michigan should just be banned from the college football playoff because they can't trick us again. We can't let them trick us again. But after the 21-3, Michigan said, you know, we can't just let it happen like this. They start showing a little bit of what they're made of. And while they're only able to make it 21-6 by the half... And then 21-9 after the half. Finally, they notched their first touchdown with 6.32 left in the third. Ronnie Bell gets a 34-yard uh, touchdown reception uh, from McCarthy. Ronnie Bell had a great game. Oh, I loved how Ronnie Bell played. Ronnie Bell and Donovan Edwards, despite how Michigan played, they still showed up at their best level. They really showed that they were the guys for Michigan on offense. And I love Donovan Edwards, dude. I really don't know. Can I be honest? I I don't know that Blake Corum is a better NFL running back prospect than Donovan Edwards. Donovan Edwards has an ability to just make something out of nothing so consistently. He's he's a really, really fun running back to watch. I, I very much enjoy watching him. And speaking about running backs, on the other side... TCU had two running backs who were absolutely great. Kendra Miller had eight rushes for 57 yards, and everybody knew how good Kendra Miller was. This was this was obvious that Kendra Miller would be a threat going into this game. But he gets hurt, and that's that was terrifying for TCU. Because TCU's ability to run the ball had been a huge part of their game plan once they had gone ahead. But Emery D. Mercado comes in and shows out even more and plays even better. 17 rushes for 150 yards, one touchdown, a long of 69, 8.8 yards per carry. TCU got it from everywhere. 
And while we were all ready for Quentin Johnson's to pull in six yard, six receptions for 163 yards and a touchdown, we were all ready for Kendra Miller to get seven yards per carry. We were all ready for Max Duggan to get nearly 300 total yards. I do not think anybody was ready for Emery DiMercato to rush for 150 and be the difference maker in this game for TCU's offense. A hell of a performance, and like the the essence of what makes college football so great is these guys who just take advantage of the situation and just write their legacy and and become superstars in an instant. Now, the quarterback battle was was a bit underwhelming. I don't think anybody would deny that. Both Duggan and McCarthy were in the mid seventies for QBR. Duggan was 14 of 29, 225, two touchdowns, two picks. McCarthy, 20 of 34, 340, two touchdowns, two picks. Um, McCarthy ran for 52. Duggan ran for 57. So in terms of yardage, McCarthy had a great game. Duggan put up some yards as well. But neither were efficient. Neither were mistake-free. Both had their moments. And I think... Duggan, within the context of the game, was a bit better because he made some big plays within the context of the game, showed that grit that we all know he has, and McCarthy just had those brutal pick sixes. The The D. Winters one was a backbreaker, it felt like, in the middle of the third quarter. It didn't prove to be. Michigan came back, and they made it very close, and they almost won despite that. But that was huge, and then the Bud Clark pick six to open it just changed the the, the momentum of the game. It changed the outlook of the game from the first minute. Those, those turnovers really, I think, proved to be the killer for Michigan. In a game that they had chances to win despite how poorly it started. A shame for them, two years straight, dropping in the college football semifinals. I wonder what the feeling is in Ann Arbor around Jim Harbaugh right now. Because he's taken them to a spot that they should be happy with. But he's had two really brutal college football playoff appearances now. A very, very interesting spot that he finds himself in, no doubt. And I, I'm I'm eager to see what'll ha happen there. Now, now a trend that I noticed between both games that I think most people didn't expect was both of the teams that were perceived to have the defenses to stop the lesser team, the team they were favored by seven or eight over, in Georgia and Michigan, were, neither were able to stop that team. Not even close. They weren't able to even come close to stopping them. The teams that were perceived to have the more athletic defense, the defense that was consistent, that would hold them in any game, were completely unable to stop the lesser teams. I wonder how that will translate to Michigan's or TCU's matchup with Georgia. The boys, the LSU Fighting Tigers, got a huge, and I don't mean huge in terms of importance, although I guess you could argue that. I'm talking huge in terms of margin of victory. The Pelicans beat the Pelicans. The Pelicans didn't beat Purdue. LSU beat Purdue. LSU beat Purdue 63-7 to in an absolute beatdown in the Cheez-It Citrus Bowl. We had some fun with it. We had, we had endless positives. I'll get into them quick because this wasn't a game that you can really, you know, analyze the game flow or, or take serious conclusions from... A lot of the game, there was really only a, the first half, really, that you could take seriously. And we did about as well as we could, coming out 35-0 at the half. Now, from the start, Brian Kelly did something a bit interesting. 
he was doing a 2-1-2-1 drive structure with Jaden Daniels and Garrett Nussmeyer. And the first thing that does is that opens the question of, is there an open quarterback competition? And are we being exposed to that now? Now, Brian Kelly has said multiple times, both quarterbacks will be able to fight for the spot in the offseason. But there's been a lot of scrutiny over like how true that is. Because while I think we've seen enough from Nussmeyer to know that he, is, he can play. Nussmeyer is not amazing in my opinion, but Nussmeyer has shown in the past few weeks he's better than I thought, and he's good enough to play at a high level. So, there's this weird air around the program of, is there a QB battle? Is there a solidified starter? Is there not? People want Nussmeyer to get a shot. The, some people think Jaden, like me, deserves to be the starter after how he played this year with the experience that he has. This did not do anything to quell that because, wow, both played really well. Both just were absolutely great. Um, I think JD was probably a bit better, a bit more consistent, a bit safer. Had a lot of great little short and mid-range throws. Made a bunch of plays on his legs. They could not stop him. They just had no idea what to do. Nussmeyer made some of his trademark special throws, though. There was one... There was one play when he's rolling out to his opposite side, makes a great throw against his body. There was another one he attacks deep down the field to Malik Neighbors. Malik actually makes one of his uh, worst plays of the game in a superstar performance, dropped a deep ball that probably should have been caught. But the, the, the consistency was on display from JD. The star power was on display from Nussmeyer, you got to see the best of both worlds. You got to once again see why LSU fans probably feel so good about their quarterback spot, the reasonable ones anyway, who aren't freaking out about one or one of the two getting a chance. I think JD is the guy. He has shown me too much con too much consistency in terms of his maybe I Maybe at times too safe, but his safer selection and decision-making. You know, there's a lot to be said for two interceptions all year, and especially the circumstance that the interceptions were in. Nussmeyer had another questionable interception in this game. It's just, I don't think it's within his capabilities, within his facilities, to go a Full, or even it seems like half of a game without throwing an interception. That's what people need to realize. He's getting shots to play now. He's getting chances to play for like, he played over half the game against Georgia, played half the game against Purdue. He's gotten several chances to play before that this season. And while he's shown us the arm he has, he's thrown an interception every time out. He throws so many interceptions. It's so bad. And while he is a good player, and he is someone who I hope succeeds, I do think that despite the label of an open QB competition going into this offseason, it is so hard for me to see anybody but Jaden Daniels being the starting quarterback next year. And I do think that that will mean that Garrett, Garrett Nussmeyer will end up transferring somewhere. Now, where that is, I don't know. I've seen a bit of buzz around Purdue. Maybe you're linking up with Jack Besh, who just transferred there. Or not Purdue, TCU, uh, where Jack Besh has just gone, to link up with him. That would be something that would excite me. I think that could be a positive. I think that could be very good for both TCU and Nussmeyer. Now, it's it's too early to say. We're not even into the offseason. We're not to the spring so we don't know. But as of now, my call, I see JD being the starter next year. I see Walker Huss uh, Walker Howard being the backup. I see Nussmeyer transferring out, and I see Ricky Collins taking a redshirt year. And that's what I see us doing. 
until Colin Hurley gets here, until Walker Howard is ready to take over, and 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 we see where all three of of Howard and Collins and Hurley are, and we do this all again. And that's the good thing about recruiting at QB well is it looks like for the next handful of years, we are going to have several good options to pick from. And it's hard to realize in the moment because a lot of the time you get caught up on the one you want. But you got to realize all these guys are going to get their chances. All these guys are talented in their own way. And we can't do anything but observe and see what the coaching staff thinks of the guys. Now, I'd be remiss if I left this segment without talking about the Herculean effort that Malik Neighbors put up. Nine catches, 163 yards, a touchdown. Two of two passing the ball, 50 yards, and a touchdown there as well. What a game. Oh my god, I love Malik Neighbors, man. A thousand yards receiving on the year. What an achievement within this offense. I'm not saying it's a bad offense, but it was not a deep ball offense. It was not a pass-heavy offense. And he still got to 1,000 yards receiving. A lot of respect for Malik Neighbors and his season and the player that he's become at LSU. What, what a great player. What a consistent player. What an all-around player. He gets the ball in his hands. He's great. He's got sticky hands. He's a great route runner. He's smart. He can throw the ball, apparently. Like, he... Oh, he's just so fun to watch. And he seems like such a cool guy. And I'm... Just with some of the turmoil that we've had with other recent wide receivers who I won't mention, it's nice to have a guy that you can always, always rely on every week. You know? You just got a guy that's going to be there. And he's going to perform. And he's going to give you at least 60, 70 yards. And sometimes he'll do this and he'll give you 170. And he'll look like a superstar. And who knows, maybe that's the guy we'll get next year. I mean, imagine he takes another step forward. We don't even need him to. He's already a very good receiver. But it's a possibility. It's something you got to think about. You know, with, with JD or Nuss taking a step forward next year, getting even better. He's shown he can play with both. He does great with either. There's no reason not to think it could happen. So you got a lot to look forward to, and this was a great way for LSU to cap off their year. 63-7 over a depleted Purdue team. You yourself were depleted, but man, you 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 didn't look like it. Also, honorary shout-out, little small thing at the end here. Derek Davis Jr. looks like a running back. Can I say that? He does not look like a safety. He looks good in that number 12, and when he steamrolled that Purdue defender at the line, man, I got pumped. I was like, hey, maybe maybe you don't transfer out. Maybe you, like, stay, and we keep you in case John Emery leaves. And maybe you're our backup running back, maybe. But, you know, who knows? That's what I'm hoping for. I'd love him to stay. I thought he looked really natural, really skilled, very strong at running back. But we've also got a lot of depth there. We've got a lot of talent. So if he leaves, it'd be understandable. I was impressed, though. I was impressed by how he played. And I, I honestly, it just came up in my head, and I thought it should be mentioned because I really thought he deserved it with how he played. Now, on to the highest-ranked football team in Louisiana. Tulane beat USC in what was probably the craziest of all the New Year's Six or college football playoff matchups, despite the fact that you had two of the greatest college football playoff games ever. Tulane beat USC 46-45 to in a shootout where approximately zero defense was played between the two teams. Not an exaggeration here. The only stops all game were turnovers. This was... This was a G5 defense playing against a Lincoln Riley defense. That's really all you can say. Um, so many points, so many yards. Almost, we almost had 1,100 yards uh, in the game. Now, USC 
got out to to the early lead and it looked like they would just win comfortably it didn't look like they were gonna blow Tulane out it didn't look like Tulane was out of it it didn't look like Tulane gave up but it looked like Tulane understood their place they were the G5 team that was supposed to make it look tough for USC give them a little bit of fight be proud but also, when the time comes, lay down and let USC go back to the glory days. And apparently, they did not get that script. Because every time USC got out to a two-score lead, Tulane, when they needed it most, went on a scoring drive. They went down 14-0 in the second quarter. Ty J Spears caps off a 75-yard drive to make it 14-7. USC goes up 35-24 late in the third quarter. Tulane immediately comes back and scores, makes it 35-30. USC goes up 45-30 with four minutes and 30 seconds left in the fourth quarter. Ty J. Spears comes up big again. 45-37 within 23 seconds. They responded when they needed to, and they responded quickly. USC could not stop Ty J. Spears. The pride of Ponchatoula. This guy is a beast. What an athlete. He looked like the best. He looked like one of the three best players on the field, and they were playing against a USC offense that was one of the best in the country with some of the best players and recruits in the country. He looked unbelievable. 17 carries for 205 yards. That is 12 yards per carry on 17 attempts. It was way too easy for Tulane to run the ball. Tulane had over 300 yards rushing, but Ty J. Spear was most of those, and man, was he impressive. He had a couple runs where he just got to the corner, then he bulldozed through a couple guys. He would take his, you know, his jukes were on point. He, he looked, he looked good. And in a game where Caleb Williams was fantastic, 460 passing yards, five touchdowns. He was unbelievable. And in a game where Brendan Rice, the son of Jerry Rice, really tried to make a name for himself on his own with the unreal catches and tiptoes that he was making near the end zone, six receptions, 174 yards, two touchdowns for Brendan Rice unreal performance and that even the statistics don't do it justice because you see some of the catches that he made some of the toe taps that he made and you're like this guy this guy there's shades this guy might be jerry rice's son you know this makes sense a little bit um so i was really i it was tough not to be impressed with either side of the offense usc had nearly 500 passing yards two lane ran it for over 300 yards Tulane had a bit of a precarious situation. They could not they could not pass the ball except for when they absolutely needed to. It was a very funny situation. Michael Pratt was 8 of 17 for 234 yards and two touchdowns. He had below 50% completion percentage. He had eight completions. He had 17 attempts. But the receivers made it happen. Jaquan Jackson had an unbelievable touchdown run. Uh, and I say run because he ran it after he got the ball at the line of scrimmage. This was not a like a deep ball to get a touchdown. He had an incredible uh, reception touchdown that makes his stats look a bit better. A lot of work done by Tulane, Tulane's receivers to inflate those stats, but they played very well. Jaquan Jackson, Deuce Watts, Alex Bauman were all great. What a what a win for TCU. And Willie Fritz turning the program around after a two-win season last year. 12 wins this year 
for Willie Fritz and Tulane. That is so impressive. I mean, do you realize how impressive that is? Crazy, crazy stuff from, from Willie Fritz with Tulane. I'm not sure where USC goes from here. Because they're in a good spot. They had a decent season. It was a decent first year for for Lincoln Riley, but can can they keep going with Alex Grinch? There's so much evidence that Alex Grinch is a bad defensive coordinator. There's just so much tape on it now. He just he cannot cannot field a good defense. He just can't. He can't do it. it. There's nothing wrong with that. He's probably a nice guy. Look, Alex Grinch is probably a fine human being. I am not, like, trying to hate on him. It's just an objective fact. He cannot coach defense as well at this level. So, I'm very eager to see if Lincoln Riley has the cojones to do something about that in the offseason. Because that would signal to me he wants to win a championship. And he's trying to win championships now. I'm eager to see how that develops for sure. It'll it'll be an interesting phenomenon. Now, after those college football semifinals, it would be tough to not be excited about the championship game, right? But even with how well both games turned out, the fact that TCU played so well, I would be lying to you guys if I saw anything other than a Georgia blowout here. I expect Georgia to take care of TCU quite easily, and I say that with a lot of sadness. I just have, I have this feeling that these last two games for Georgia were the wake-up call especially against Ohio State. I think at the end there, they realized this is not easy. These teams are good. These teams are great. We're just better. And we're going to have to play our best to win, even though we're the best. And they turned it on, and they did They did well there. And I kind of, maybe it's just that fear, because I, I feel like they're almost the new Bama but I, I, it's so tough for me to see Kirby Smart not having them coming out and being prepared for what TCU can throw at them. And TCU is not a bad team. Look, TCU has Max Duggan, has Kendra Miller, has Quentin Johnson, has Emery DiMercato on offense. They've got weapons. Their defensive playmakers looked special. D. Winters, Bud Clark had great games. Those were guys who you really thought Oh, these guys could be in the SEC, no problem. They'd they'd look they they would not look a bit out of place in the SEC. These guys make plays on the highest level. But it's undeniable that UGA is going to have more top end talent. They're going to have more depth, and it's hard for me to imagine that their coaching shows up is overwhelmed from the start as they were against Ohio State. I think it'll take a lot of mistakes from Georgia to not win that game. I feel very confident in that too. Now, I was wrong about the Ohio State-Georgia game. I thought that would be a blowout. Or maybe not a blowout, but a comfortable win. I was right about TCU. I thought they had a shot to win that one close. We'll see where this one goes. I've just... I've got a feeling that it won't happen. There's just... There's a lot of things that need to go right for TCU. Their DBs need to be able to to get off the field. They need to be able to keep those insanely fast UGA wide receivers in front of them. Johnson, Miller, DiMercato, Duggan would all have to play well. You know, even their even their um their utility guys, their alternate options like Hudson and Barber would have to play play well as well. So you just got a really difficult win conditions for TCU. I feel. 
Now, UGA has allowed 71 points in their last two games, 30 to LSU, 41 to Ohio State. Teams have had success attacking the mid-to-mid-deep range passing against UGA. I worry that Max Max Duggan is not consistent enough in those ranges to make UGA pay. I think Max Duggan's a great player. I don't think him staying in the pocket and just delivering mid-range passes while he's stationary is the best way for him to thrive. And he'll be able to run the ball. C.J. Stroud had 34 rushing yards. He was able to get some, some decent rushes, but he's not going to get 50. I would I would bet a lot on that. So he'll have to make a ton of consistent plays in the air, and I don't see that happening. I just think that's too tough of a win condition for, for TCU. And I think TCU is a great team. I'd love to see them make it close, but I just think UGA is better, and I think they've been the best team in the country all year. Oh, the Pelicans can't catch a break, can they? They really can't. We find ourselves in this position again on the endless seesaw of New Orleans Pelicans basketball, where we... Thought, think that we attain happiness for just a moment, just to have it struck down. Oh, it, and it and it feels bad to complain, right? Because it's been such a good season. We're top three in the West. We have been all season. You know, it's us, the Grizzlies, the Nuggets. That's just how it's been. But this team just isn't getting a chance to perform at their highest level, and it sucks. It's such a shame. I just want to see them play. I want to see them get to play their best. And they just haven't gotten that chance. Zion Williamson is out for at least three weeks with a hamstring strain. He's going to miss some substantial time. Depending on how you look at it, either very fortunate or unfortunate timing with the injury too. Because it does appear that Brandon Ingram is getting closer and closer to coming back. It does look like he's almost ready to make that comeback. And man, was I excited to just see these two play together. It's all I want. I just want these guys to get a shot to play. They, It's just... Man, I haven't loved two Pelicans players this much since like Chris Paul and David West. And they just... They can't be on the floor at the same time. They're just always both hurt so much. And it makes me so sad. And I don't know if it's something that's going to ever be resolved or or we'll just have to live with it. But man, I just want to see these two play together. Now, the Pelicans last week or so, we've dropped two in a row, including the game against the Sixers where Zion got hurt. We lost that one 120 to 111. And that, it was a good game. It was a good game. The Pels were in it the whole way. They all, they trailed the whole way, but they were in it the whole way. I would have taken a blowout loss if it would have meant Zion Williamson would not get hurt. Now, Zion was great. In 28 minutes... Zion was 10 of 12, 26 points, 6 rebounds, 7 assists. It's just, watching his stat line almost gets tiring because, like, it's just so casual for him. He puts up the most insane stat lines and nobody will notice or, like, know how to stop it. And he won't even be it. It's so casual for him, and I admire his ability in that regard so, so highly. But... The Pelicans are going to have to make do now without Zion Williamson. They've done that well this season. They're 5-2 and two without Zion Williamson on the season. Now, that doesn't account for being without Zion and Ingram because there were some games earlier in the season where Ingram was playing and Zion wasn't. So it's a, it's a precarious situation, no doubt. Man, 
these guys have got to get a chance to play together though one day, right, for an extended period of time. It's just they're too special. They're too unique. They're too exciting. This team's too good. Oh, it just feels like a gut punch every time we hear something like this when the other one is so close to getting back. It's a great season regardless. I got a lot of hope for how this team's going to fight without Zion. They're a great team even without Zion. They seem to play they seem to lift each other up when their stars are out, which is a very good thing. The role players all play better when the stars aren't there, so they they can they can win these games that that you might almost struggle with your best players because there's this elevated level of understanding and responsibility and confidence, which I think is got to be a result of Willie Green being the head coach. That's something that I think it has been, you know, talked about a ton, but he is a motivator. He is a player's coach. They love him. And I think those guys have the utmost confidence when they go out there, regardless of whether Zion or Brandon Ingram are healthy. Now, it's a big stretch. It's a tough stretch coming up for the Pelicans. They've got Houston and Brooklyn at home. Then they have... Seven of their next eight games on the road. An absolutely brutal stretch of games on the way. Will be a huge, huge part in telling where this team's going to finish. Because still in the middle of that heated top three race in the West. You know? Trey Murphy, does he stay in form? Will Brandon Ingram be back? These things are all going to be a huge factor in, in these wins. Uh, and losses without Zion. So it's it, it's going to be very interesting to see how they perform. We've just got so many different factors that have been in the in the move for the Pelicans this year. That is going to be all for Episode 7 of the Red Zone. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, follow and listen on Spotify, the Red Zone Pod with Grant Lanero on Instagram or TikTok at underscore the Red Zone Podcast, all underscores you can see on the poster behind me on YouTube at Grant Lanero. Feel free to sub, like the video. I will be with you guys next time for episode eight. Until then, 